So Daniel Farrens is back at it again with a new crime movie, Ted Bundy, American Boogeyman. Oh God, we're not off to a good start already, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, have you already forgotten about Daniel Farrens? The genius behind such reasonable movies like The Haunting of Sharon Tate, in which director Daniel Farrens went against the wishes of Tate's own sister to make this weirdo escape fantasy of a movie where Sharon gets visions of her murder and prevails against the Manson people. Except not at all, because then ghost visions of themselves walk away from their own dead bodies. Also, it stars Hilary Duff. Hilary, you're so much better than this. Or the instant classic, The Murder of Nicole Brown Simpson, in which Daniel Farrens explores the possibility that serial killer Glenn Edward Rogers actually killed her, and does so in a series of very stupid and fictional ways once described as cinematic grave robbing. Also, it starred Mina Suvari, as in American Pie Mina Suvari, or Loser Mina Suvari, and tragically more recently, What Lies Below Mina Suvari. Girl, you are too good for all of this. But yeah, when I say he went against the wishes of Tate's sister. I mean, he wrote her a letter talking about how important the Manson murders were to him because he was born the same year it happened. Oh, Daniel, give fucking help. You are a true crime menace. You know what has a lot of true crime that doesn't suck? Today's sponsor, Audible. You guys know the drill by now. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. Whether you're into new releases, classic, memoirs, podcasts, and more, Audible has you covered with thousands of titles. So if you're someone who has a long commute or you just like listening to something while working or running errands, Audible is a fantastic choice for you. I'd personally recommend Mindhunter by FBI profiler John E. Douglas that went on to inspire the Netflix series if you actually want to experience some good first-hand investigative work. Unlike this movie. I even got my mom a subscription for Christmas last year and she loved it so much that that's just what I get to give her again this year. Merry Christmas, Mom. And speaking of the holiday season, Audible is offering 60% off your first three months, so what better time to give yourself the gift that keeps on giving? Because every month you get one credit to use on any title, including new releases that you get to keep for life. And that's not all. With Audible, you get access to the Plus Catalog, which provides members with unlimited access to select audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, sleep tracks, and more at no additional cost. So if you want to take advantage of this limited time offer and save 60% off your first three months of Audible, that is only $5.95 a month. Head on over to audible.com slash Jedi or text Jedi to 500-500. I have videos on both of those movies if you're curious for more details. I've been told they're fairly entertaining. The videos, not the movies. <laughs> but again, today we have Ted Bundy, American Boogeyman. And it looks like Hilary Duff called up her classic Prince Charming because Bundy is being played by Chad Michael Murray himself. It's like they saw Efron tackle the role and they're like, let's just go back a few years and take that age demographics teen heartthrob. Does this man just prey on once promising actors? Like all of the budget must go to that like central cast member and like maybe one other person. And I guess it has like some moments where it works, but like the creative choices in this goddamn movie. I say creative, but like, ugh. But you guys almost got a double feature here today because it looks like he used a single budget to make a two for bad crime thriller shit fest. The second in this, what I would have to assume is a series being Eileen Warno's American Boogie Woman. Where is this man getting his money? Now in that letter to Tate's sister, Daniel says that he loves to express himself artistically and be able to voice his feelings, memories, and his interpretations of the stories that have inspired or affected him in a deeply personal way. Which really translates to him taking real life tragedies and just completely making shit up around them because he feels like it. Sometimes there is actually an existing theory that he's basing some of his bullshit on, but other times he just does shit for no reason. And he gets other movies and he can do whatever he wants, but for someone who claims to care about the crimes that he's discussing, he really doesn't show it. True crime can get murky and stuff with serial killers can be harder because you just don't want to glorify them or make them seem cool or mysterious, but there is something about them that like haunts and infects people's brains and like genuinely terrifies them. And I completely understand the desire to explore those stories and like how these people manage to like have their reign of terror mostly due to poor jurisdictional sharing of information and bad criminal, uh, you know, like bad, like not, not having access to DNA stuff. 
that's most of it. <laughs> but the way Daniel tackles things is just so fucking unusual. And all I'm gonna say is in this one, at least like most of the movie doesn't deal with like following victims. Like I also take that back though, because he treats victims fucking horrendously in this. Now with this movie, I don't actually know what the purpose of making it was. It has no clear vision or focus. It's not based on anyone's personal accounts. I know something like Zodiac shows that kills, but then it's also following like Robert Graysmith's personal account of the situation and then the police investigation. So there's some kind of like unified goal uh, in mind of like the investigation. But this movie has stuff from like Bundy's perspective, but it's just the crimes and then him like monologuing over his actions uh, with quotes from his final confession tapes and some weird shit that Farron's made up. And that fabrication treatment just continues with the victims, especially as it moves into what happened in Florida. But what Farron's claims is the main focus is the police perspective, specifically that of Kathleen McChesney, who was a real person who worked her way up from like detective to the FBI uh, and did work on the Bundy case, except we never see a lick of investigative work here at all, which we will get to. You see her like caring about the families and talking about how she's gonna nab this guy and how these women matter, but not anything that actually makes her seem competent. So yeah. And as per usual, it's just a horrendously made movie in so many ways. There's bad acting, bad camera work, rough dialogue. It's just rough. Okay, let's hop into it though. Right out of the gate, we get a disclaimer saying that this movie is a dramatization of actual events and that a lot of the details were changed for dramatic purposes. And I'm gonna comment that that's a little weird because Daniel Farrens is the type of guy who's gonna insist on using real crime scene photos and footage for authenticity, but then will just make shit up. Which he can do, but just say that you wanna make something that plays into the violence and spectacle and move on. Like, we all know it, we all see it. But the movie starts with what will be the disappearance of Melissa Smith, who is meeting up with a friend who recently broke up with her boyfriend. How could he stand me up for Heidi Moore? If you switch her first and last initials, her name is Mighty Whore. All right, I'm out. It's been a good run here. Okay, so this movie suggests that her friend was actually lured over by Bundy first and then almost grabbed, but as far as I know, that did not happen. But because of the luring, I will take a moment to issue a disclaimer. Ladies and dudes too, honestly, uh, don't feel like you have to put yourself in uncomfortable and potentially unsafe situations because you feel like you have to be polite and want to avoid being rude. It's a super common thing people do not to rock the boat or come across as like mean or something. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if you're being rude to somebody who is making you uncomfortable as long as you're safe. This was a bait and switch. Her friend ends up getting into the car of her ex-boyfriend and then he goes for Melissa. And it's really fucking gross because again they have him like reciting off quotes from his final confession tapes in a way that makes him sound like some kind of like badass and not the complete fucking loser that he was. Do I feel guilty for anything I've done? No. And in all Daniel Farron's glory shows him tossing her decapitated head into his trunk. Again, this fuck can say he cares about the victims all he wants, but it seems like he just wants to make movies that amp up the spectacle for absolutely no reason and it's only gonna get worse from here on out. Like I know that there are a ton of movies that deal with serial killers that show violence and blood. I I'm always gonna kind of keep going back to Zodiac because that's a movie that I feel like was like so incredibly well done, but on the same hand, you could make the argument that it like kind of glorifies up some of those kills. But tossing her decapitated head into a trunk? Like, come on, dude. It then cuts to the shittiest high school production on-screen text intro I've ever seen. Okay, well, not the shittiest. I think Derek Savage still owns that title. Pretty shitty, and the music vaguely reminds me of something out of Halloween. Good lord. But then it cuts away from him to the police going through the victims, and pretty sure, as per usual, he is using real crime scene photos. Again, gotta go that extra mile for authenticity, except where he doesn't at all. Then this fuck pops in. Boxy, long legs, short skirts. Maybe they led this guy on. Why does he have this like massive shit eating grin on his face when he's talking about a series of murdered and missing women? Also, keep in mind that these girls fell into like the perfect victim category that is like a horrible thing to consider. But like, I'm pretty sure people were like very concerned with the fact that like somebody got kidnapped out of their home. Also, you can't see their legs, dude. But it seems like they're just really trying to like uh, amp up this misogyny angle uh, in the workplace and just like specifically how like all of these guy cops didn't care about these 
missing and murdered women, which yeah, in a lot of situations they don't, but I don't actually think this was one of those times, uh, whatever. And yeah, I get it. Women detectives definitely had it hard back then and probably still do in a lot of situations and they weren't even allowed joining the FBI until like 1972, but like pick an angle. All right, the stuff with Kathleen's supposed to be the angle. Ah. <laughs> and as mentioned, this is Kathleen McChesney, who did help in the Bundy case, but this movie is uh, certainly going to take some liberties with her in a way that only Daniel Farrens could venture to imagine. That's not a compliment. <laughs> but because of the Lake Sammamish murders, and I just gotta say that Ted Bundy was a fucking idiot. He told people in broad daylight his real name, that his name was Ted while he was trying to kidnap women again in broad daylight. I am still so pissed that he wasn't caught sooner because he was an absolute dumbass. Christ, even his girlfriend at the time called in on him. Like stop letting him read his little killer monologues here and have somebody grilling him on being a fucking idiot who was spared mostly by the stupidity of police jurisdiction. At least the movie does actually mention that the Seattle office didn't have any kind of computerized database or method of transferring information between jurisdictions. And the cops tend to be really weird about that shit because it's like, nah, this is our case, but like, but as she's flexing her intelligence over her stupid colleagues, Robert Ressler shows up, AKA the guy who coined the modern use of the term serial killer. He's actually the one who developed psychological profiling in the FBI and along with John Douglas traveled the country interviewing serial killers to learn patterns and help in future cases, AKA the basis for Mindhunter. You know, I figure it's a good idea to have at least one gal on the team, you know, soften up the witnesses, you know what I mean? Okay, sir, I get why you wanted to highlight women, but this ain't fitting the vibe, dude. But it cuts back to Ted on Halloween in Salt Lake City and once again has him reciting some of his final confession tapes. It's really like they just looked up like Ted Bundy quotes and just went down the list. Ugh, it was like talking about how society wants a way to identify evil people, but there's no way you can really do that. And that no man is truly innocent. Yeah, Ted, but not all men murder people brutally. But he ends it off with a question asking, why? The movie will try to examine a potential reason, but again, the focus is just so scattered and it's not anything new, but we'll, we'll get there. Because the movie then chooses to go over the audio of how he picked people, women who radiated vulnerability. Evil Fuck off and die, rape! Yeah, okay. It then makes this super dramatized chase scene out of Laura Amy, which likely did not happen. No idea why he felt the need to swap that up here other than honestly disrespecting the uh, experiences of real victims. As far as I know, the going theory is that she just entered his car. True crime's already a rough thing to juggle and this dude just doesn't give a fuck. Then we get to the one that got away, Carol Durant. And Daniel can't help himself from making this one more dramatic too. In real life, he gets one cuff on her and pulled a gun, but she managed just to get out of the car and run away. In the movie, he actually hits her with a crowbar and she just keeps running to this van as if nothing happens, just like a minor flinch. Not even remotely phased, they even edited a blood trail into this and a pretty intense impact sound and she's just fine. That didn't happen, he didn't hit her at all. Like why the fuck did you add that, Daniel? Daniel, we got breathe. Then we get a bar scene with Kathleen and Robert where it seems like she pitches him the term serial killer because it's like a serial show, a never ending cycle. But that's how Robert Ressler pitched it. Consider it yours, Agent Ressler. No credit necessary. Is he suggesting that Ressler actually took it from her? Either way, the term popped up a lot earlier in German publications, so who cares? But like, how about you highlight her actual achievements instead of just making shit up? Unless that is something out there that she's said and I missed it, but like for some reason, I just, I don't think so. Unrelated what is up with these coffee cups? It's like a plastic cup inside an actual mug. Anyways, it cuts to more of Ted stalking and he's just like in the door and this girl doesn't notice. Like people notice shit like that. I'm sorry, it is a full window door and he's blocking most of the lights. And then of course he's gone as she circles back into the room. Come on, man, is he Ted Bundy or Michael fucking Meyer? Stop making him seem like well, like the fucking boogeyman, Jesus. <laughs> this is when Ted gets arrested, the first time in link to the abduction of Carol DeRanch, and was also a major person of interest in all of these murders. And in this moment, he's being interviewed by an FBI psychologist, and it's like Bundy's offering up advice from his psych undergrad to hypothesize about the killer. And then he asks about the potential of the killer keeping mementos. When you work hard to do something right, you don't want to forget it. 
I can honestly say Theodore Bundy is the most dangerous individual I've ever observed. Yeah, I don't know if all that was said, but oh well. <laughs> it gives him a chance to bring up the entity that Ted Bundy liked to claim was the one responsible for his actions. That there was essentially the public facing Bundy that was more charming and then the one that committed the crimes. And provided a very convenient platform to bring up the pornography defense. That Bundy blamed seeing explicit images of violence as being something that fueled his behavior. I always thought that was a cop out. I always just assumed that him being the way he was drew him to that kind of pornography that then escalated into his actual crimes. Because people all over the world watch all sorts of weird porn, Ted, and not all of them were moved to murder women and necrophilia. Fucking Christ, he is not an enigma. He's just a fucking loser who should have been caught long before he actually was. And incompetence allowed him to break out not once, but two times and then commit some of his most brutal crimes. Then this dude says something weird about Ted believing that the killings are giving him magical abilities which I don't remember ever being brought up with Ted. I gotta admit though, it's hilarious that while this conversation is happening, Ted is just slowly walking to the window to imply that he knows what they're talking about and it's like some creepy moment. Daniel. Daniel, this is absurd. Then it comes to two years later after he escaped from prison the second time. And it shows him failing to strangle someone in Florida before he steals the VW Beetle, which I still can't believe he did in real life, uh, stealing the same kind of car you got arrested for. Okay, anyways, but I also uh, don't think that failed strangling happened. As far as I know, the sorority house was his first attack in Florida, and I think they added this for one reason that I'll get to soon. But then it cuts to McChesney and wrestler interviewing Bundy's mom, who was played by Lynn Shay, aka the mom from Detroit Rock City. And besides, those jeans are so tight, I can see your penis. Sweaty, why are you here? Either way, she doesn't believe he's guilty, which is accurate. I'm pretty sure his mom maintained his innocence until the day she died. But while this is happening, the Seattle task force gets shut down and Kathleen's a little bit upset. Fuck you. No. Fuck you both. And this is where things get really murky. Again, don't think that attempted strangulation ever happened. So these posters weren't a thing, but even if they were, seriously, oh yeah, guys, keep an eye out for this mysterious unidentified man who's in a full ski mask in Florida. Anyways, it is true that Ted rented a place under the name Chris, and I don't think it was literally from this person who was like the sorority house den mother. It was at a place called The Oaks, but not like this. You look kind of familiar. I got it. Paul Newman. <laughs> And he absolutely did not introduce himself to Cheryl. There is a theory that he might have stalked Cheryl and planned to go there first, but then was dissuaded because someone was outside, went to the sorority house, then swung back around to break into Cheryl's house. And she mentioned that somebody was riding a bike by her house that might have been Bundy because he looked familiar, but there's really no way to know. But this movie literally has him asking her out, which then fuels this weird mannequin fantasy violent sex stream when she says no, as if to suggest that him being turned down for a date is why he would do this and instead of just like him being who he is. Also literally pulled the Ted appears in the window thing again, guys. Guys, come on. Also, Cheryl is played by Greer Grammer, AKA Kelsey Grammer's daughter, who was in that weird as fuck Deadly Illusions movie that I also covered on my channel. You can go watch that video right now if you're interested. Yeah, the scene of him snapping. My God. Also, she gives him a plate of sandwiches that Dottie made and uh... <laughs> Dude, those were Dottie's meatloaf sammies. They didn't turn you down for a date. Yeah, he has this fantasy where he's being tied up and dominated by women, but they are literally just the fashion mannequins, meaning that he had to like do this to himself. At least this is a scene that makes him seem like a fucking loser. So I have to be like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm down with this creative licensing. I'm invisible. It's also kind of weird that Daniel had these college girls acting like they were like middle schoolers at a slumber party fighting over tidy whities just like very weird. It felt like they were purposely being infantilized for some reason and I don't, I don't think I like that. But Cheryl actually ends up in his room and sees his violent porno red rabbit magazines that are just like conveniently laid out on the bed in like a solid order. But circling back to that attempted strangulation, I think they added that in so wrestler would have some kind of reason to think that Bundy was in Florida. But then they also changed when Kimberly Leach died. She was Bundy's last victim and it's fucking tragic. And I really can't believe that Daniel Farrens would change the order of Bundy's crimes just to fit his like weirdo narrative of focusing in on Cheryl as a survivor. Like nothing wrong with refocusing the narrative on like the victims and the survivors, but the method of doing so is 
fucked. Literally just to give Wrestler and McChesney a reason to be in Florida, and I don't even think that, like, her dying first would have been required for that. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? But I get why, because it gets worse. See, when Cheryl wandered into his place, he ends up giving her a bracelet he says he found, except they showed us that same bracelet on Kimberly's wrist. Suggesting that he took a souvenir from a victim that in the real life events had not been killed yet and gave it to a future planned victim. Daniel, what the fuck is wrong with you? Also, he never would have done that. Like, how is anything you're doing giving back to the victims in any kind of positive way. How, Daniel? Show me how. And again, he's in a fucking doorway and no one sees him. This needs to stop. He is not Drax. He doesn't think he's invisible. But then it gets the night of, and no joke, 20 minutes of this movie is essentially dedicated to him brutally attacking and terrorizing these women. Not trying to glorify his actions or anything, though. <laughs> Fuck you. Oh, also, Cheryl didn't live in the sorority house, but whatever. It was also pointed out to me that it looks like there's a sticker on the glass that they forgot to take off than did midway through the scene? It's pretty horrific. He even plays the whole like door opening, but no one's there. Then suddenly he's actually been in the room the whole time thing. At one point he's calling the house like fucking ghost face. Hello? It's very dumb considering this was like just this disorganized blitz attack. But yeah, they added shit and changed the timeline to give Wrestler and McChesney a reason to be trolling around different Florida campuses waiting for something to happen. And McChesney actually makes it into the sorority house while Bundy is still there. And we see Karen, a survivor, just like gurgle bleeding in the hallway and it shows him biting a girl's breast. Again, like no reason for any of this. It's just like, it's gross. I'm not gonna show it because it is very graphic, but like Daniel, tell me what is giving a positive focus to the women involved in this tragedy. Show me. This man is my nemesis and he has no idea I exist. And he has to go further into the dramatic with the whole like, I'm invisible, I'm no one, I'm not here. When Kathleen tries to shoot him multiple times and he just, Houdini's. Daniel, you need to stop. You can't say you're trying to avoid glorifying Bundy and then literally give him superpowers. Then he just walks out as the cops or campus security flood in. Are you kidding me? Then he walks by Dottie covered in blood and just walks away with a smile on his face and no one stops him. I am no one. God, I fucking wish I was no one after this movie. As in, I wish I didn't exist. Okay, that's an exaggeration, but holy shit, dude. Do you see why I couldn't cover both of the movies at once like this man? And it's not even done. It cuts him being arrested and then executed, and it kind of like shows him like fighting against the bondage a bit. And then it shows McChesney and Wrestler going back to his mom's house to let her listen to the confession tapes before they go public. And that did happen out of courtesy, but in this, it's like, you have no time to react and we're gonna play you this shit. I enjoyed her pain. <laughs> suffering. And her reaction may seem like something only a movie can come up with, but I assure you the real account says this is exactly what she said. How about ice cream and hot apple pie? Like the denial here is thick. But then she starts singing Amazing Grace, which I'm sure did not actually happen, and cuts to a horribly photoshopped picture of her face on a real picture of Bundy's mother. Oh my god. Then to Amazing Grace, it goes over the other Florida victims and actually acknowledges that Wrestler was the one credited with the modern use of the term serial killer. Then why did you make us think McChesney suggested it? Ugh. The music choice is just absolutely fucking horrendous too, man. Holy shit. But that's the movie. Again, I will draw attention to the fact that in an interview, Farron said that he wanted to focus on Kathleen McChesney, not only her contributions to this investigation, but her struggles to make it in a male-dominated field. But the problem is, you didn't show her doing anything. Even in the end, it was like she was fighting Casper the murder ghost. He also said that he and Chad tried to make sure they didn't humanize Bundy too much, but they fucking veered in the opposite direction and made him seem like some kind of supernatural natural entity. It's fucking stupid. Like, I understood the more nuanced conversation around extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile. But this movie just completely fails at everything the director claims it was aiming to do and honestly goes completely in the opposite direction to the point that I'm like, do words mean the same thing to you as they do to everyone else? But I guess that's it until I cover the Warnos one. Ah. <laughs> But that is going to do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. If you're interested in other aspects of my thoughts, feel free to follow me on social media that I will have linked down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay. And we'll catch you all later.
This fucking man needs to be stopped.